When most people think of video games that have combined genres over the years in unique and creative ways, one of the first to be mentioned is almost always Actraiser, a title created by Japanese developer Quintet and published by Enix that combined both action-heavy platforming with simulation-like city building. Actraiser showed that two unlikely genres could be mixed together in the same pot to create a surprisingly engaging experience, and that taking a risk and attempting something new could lead to some pretty successful results. Although it is generally seen as a very respected and important title many years later today, Actraiser's largely ambitious ideas came about from a very small team who had broken off to try and follow their own path in a very competitive gaming industry. Actraiser's story begins not with Quintet or Enix, but instead with Japanese video game developer and publisher Nihon Falcom. Two programmers named Masaya Hashimoto and Tomoyoshi Miyazaki had worked at Falcom throughout the 1980s creating games for the company. Their most notable accomplishment was the action RPG franchise Ease, a series created in an attempt to make the genre a bit more accessible and one that would not target the hardcore RPG enthusiasts many other companies were pursuing. Ease tried to avoid forcing players to grind extensively for levels and focused its efforts on being a more streamlined and enjoyable experience from the player's perspective. Hashimoto and Miyazaki both loved video games and spent much of their free time immersed in the latest titles for PC platforms like the PC-88 and MSX and Nintendo's now very successful Famicom console. Both men were very accomplished programmers and helped Falcom find much of its success, especially in the late 80s. Around this time though, many of Falcom's employees had expressed interest in shifting their focus to creating games for Nintendo's Famicom home console instead of the personal computer platforms they had been developing for since the company's inception. Falcom was a very conservative company though and refused to budge on their PC-focused ways. Near the end of development on the third entry of the Ease series, Wanderers from Ease, in 1989, many of these concerns and desires to change would come to a head, resulting in Hashimoto and Miyazaki leaving the company. The two would not leave on the best of terms with Falcom, as their previous employer was angry and upset with their decision to depart and set off on their own. The duo would establish their own company called Quintet that same year in April of 1989, some later questioned if the company had been formed earlier in 1987 due to the word quintet showing up in the credits of the Famicom version of Falcom's Dragon Slayer 4, known as Legacy of the Wizard in the West, but series creator Yoshio Kia later disproved this in an interview, stating that the word quintet, which means a group of five, referred to the Drosley family, whom are the main characters of the game. While quintet is often a term used in music to describe a group of five performers, the word was chosen by Hashimoto and Miyazaki to represent what they considered were the five parts of game development, programming, planning, graphics, sound, and producing. Once the company was formed, they began to work on their debut title. It would not be for a PC platform though, but instead for Nintendo's upcoming new console, the Super Famicom. Quintet's first game started its life as a more straightforward RPG title, with its theme based around depicting the entire life cycle of a planet, from its birth to its demise. The team worked tirelessly on the project, but once it was around 70% complete, they felt that it was not quite the type of game they wanted as their debut title on the Super Famicom, or the Super NES as it's known in the West. It also may have been a bit too large and ambitious to fit on the 4 megabyte cartridge they were targeting. The game was cancelled, but not entirely scrapped, as the idea would be used a couple of years later as the basis for another quintet title, Terranigma. The team then went right back to work on a new idea after the decision was made to restart development. Masaya Hashimoto would act as both the title's director and its lead programmer. 
Tomoyoshi Miyazaki would write the game's story and scenario, and Yasuyuki Sone of Enix took the role of its producer. Yuzo Koshiro would score the game's memorable soundtrack, while his sister Ayano Koshiro worked on its graphical design and sprite art. Both siblings had previously worked at Falcom alongside Hashimoto and Miyazaki, but had also left their previous employer and were looking for work as freelancers. With Yuzo already having composed music for the Ease series and Ayano handling much of its sprite art and enemy designs, the two were easy choices to bring on board the project. Initially, the game had the working titles of Sacred Master and The World Master, before it eventually received its final name, Actraiser, or Akutoreza, as it would be pronounced in Japan. It would pull its main inspiration from Judeo-Christian religious themes, with the player assuming the role of God, the game's protagonist, that would face off against Satan, the title's evil antagonist who had corrupted the world and plunged it into chaos, with demons and monsters running rampant all over. Satan had defeated God hundreds of years prior, who retreated to heaven, represented as a sky palace, to recover from his wounds and eventually fell into a deep sleep. The land was then divided into six regions, with Satan assigning one of his guardians to each area. God awakened to find the world he had protected overrun by monsters, who were once the very same humans who gave him his power. He would need to fight back the six guardians, free the souls of his people, and defeat Satan to bring peace back to the world once more. Actraiser would be split into two different types of gameplay, action and simulation. Each region would begin with a more action-oriented platforming section, or act as they were referred to in-game, where God would take control of a derelict statue and make his way through a stage themed around each region. From tree-filled forests and desert wastelands, to volcanic caves and snow-covered mountains, Actraiser had no shortage of different and unique environments that would need to be traversed and overcome. The player would need to maneuver obstacles and defeat monsters in each region's first stage to make the area habitable once more so that the humans could start safely building settlements. God's animated statue could attack enemies using both melee-focused strikes with its sword and a variety of magic attacks that slowly became available and increased in uses as the player progressed through the game. At the end of each level, the player would need to confront and defeat a boss to complete the stage. While Actraiser's main themes were pulled from Judeo-Christianity, its bosses would often be based on creatures and entities from other religions and folklore, like the Centaur and Minotaurus from Greek mythology, the Manticore from Persian mythology, Kalia, likely based on Kali from Hinduism, the Pharaoh from Egyptian culture, and the Firewheel, likely based on the Wanyudo Yokai from Japanese folklore. After completing the first act of a region, the game would change drastically and shift to an overhead map view with more simulation-like city-building gameplay. Rather than controlling the statue avatar found in the platforming sections, the player would instead take control of an angel resembling Cupid that could fly around the entire area. The angel would need to direct the humans as to where they should build their roads and settlements on a grid-like map. The player could also use God's abilities to help clear out the land allowing for structures to be built and the region's population and faith to grow. These abilities, or miracles as they were called, would mostly be based on different types of weather and would cost varying amounts of SP, similar to magic points, to use. Included in these miracles were lightning, which destroyed smaller trees, bushes, rocks, and houses, rain that could douse fires and restore barren land, sunlight which melted snow and dried up marshlands, wind which could blow anything flying in the air away, and an earthquake which could destroy houses and fields, as well as affect entire landmasses. As the population and faith increased, both the angel and animated statue would grow in power and receive more hit points and SP. While the angel was directing humanity's expansion in each region, monsters would continuously spawn from various layers scattered around the map. These layers could be sealed by simply guiding the settlers to them, but in the meantime they would try to abduct the humans, destroy their fields and buildings, and damage the player. Thankfully, the angel could shoot arrows and defeat the oncoming threats, giving the game somewhat of a real-time strategy feel. If his life bar was depleted though, he would be unable to fire arrows and was helpless to defend against the monster's advances for a short period of time. 
This would not leave the region completely defenseless though, as the player could use miracles like wind to blow the enemies away, and special items, referred to as offerings, to instantly destroy all enemies on the map. These offerings could also temporarily boost the strength of the angel's arrows, and even permanently increase the amount of lives and magic uses, represented by scrolls, that the statue avatar could use in the platforming stages. The game would be split into six different regions. Fillmore, Bloodpool, Cassandora, Itos, Marana, and Northwall. God could move back and forth between these regions at any point by moving his sky sanctuary around on the world map. Once certain goals had been accomplished in the simulation mode, a second platforming stage would become available and let the statue avatar face off against Satan's guardian for that region after making its way through more traps and hordes of enemies. The player would continue this pattern in each of the game's different areas, with a lengthy simulation segment sandwiched between two action-oriented side-scrolling stages. The final stage, Deathheim, would feature a boss rush of the six main guardians fought back to back, culminating in a showdown with Satan. After completing the game, a new special mode would unlock, known as professional or action mode in other regions, that would completely cut out the simulation sections and let the player go through all of the action side-scrolling stages back to back, similar to a more standard platforming title. While Actraiser's unique mix of action and simulation-based gameplay was incredibly forward-thinking and innovative, its music was nearly just as memorable and impressive. To complement the game's epic tale of good versus evil, Yuzal Koshiro envisioned an epic orchestral soundtrack taking inspiration from John Williams' memorable movie scores, and with the Super NES's ability to utilize audio samples, this vision was more possible now than ever before. He struggled with the new sound chip though, as it was quite different from the FM synthesis chips he was so used to composing for in the past. The amount of available memory he had to work with was also very limited. Thankfully, Hashimoto's genius programming and workarounds on the drivers for the new console's sound chip would help Actraiser's musical score become something truly amazing. Koshiro spent much more time focusing on getting the orchestral instrument samples he was using to sound as realistic as possible on this new hardware than on writing the actual compositions themselves. Probably the title's most popular and well-known track, Fillmore, was directly inspired by Koshiro's love of the music from the Castlevania series. Actraiser's soundtrack was so stunning that famed video game composer Nobuo Uematsu actually reworked his own samples for the upcoming Final Fantasy IV after hearing the game's impressive use of the Super NES's sound chip. Chrono Trigger's composer Yasunori Mitsuda was also inspired by Koshiro's masterpiece and has talked about how influential it was for music composition at nearly every Japanese video game company once the title hit the market. Actraiser's music received multiple original and arranged soundtrack releases over the years, and even was performed live in various concerts by symphony orchestras. The game would first be released in Japan as Akutoreza for the Super Famicom in December of 1990, just one month after the console had made its Japanese debut. It performed very well sales-wise, and a decision was made to localize it for the North American market. The initial version was rejected, as Nintendo of America had very strict rules and regulations for anything published on their consoles that depicted religious themes or imagery. Both of its main characters, God and Satan, who were obviously Judeo-Christian references, would be renamed to the Master and Tanzra, respectively. Some of the region names would also be altered slightly from their Japanese names, and small parts of the story were changed to make it a bit less dark. Many of its sprites would need to be modified as well, Koji Yokota, a newer quintet employee who had also formerly worked at Falcom on the E-Series, would help handle these visual changes. Enemies, icons, map locations, and boss portraits would all receive minor changes to bring them in line with Nintendo's tough regulations. There were also plenty of other adjustments made to item placements and overall gameplay that often made this version quite a bit easier than its Japanese counterpart. Actraiser launched in North America for the Super NES in November of 1991, with a now capitalized R in its title. 
It then hit European shores roughly a year and a half later in March of 1993. The game even received an arcade version for the Nintendo Super System, an arcade cabinet that played select Super NES games. This port was very similar to the special or professional modes found on the home console version and featured only the game's platforming stages. Actraiser would later make its way to mobile phones in 2003 with a very poorly received port that featured only three of the side-scrolling stages from the original game and none of its simulation sections. This version was plagued with being way too short and having poor controls. A follow-up would be released exclusively in Japan the next year in 2004, titled Aktoreza Chapter 2, and would now include all six areas. In 2007, the game also made its way to the Nintendo Wii on its digital game service, the Virtual Console. After Actraiser's initial 1990 release though, Quintet moved on to a different project, completely separate from their freshman release. But little did they know that they'd be creating a sequel for their unique game much sooner than they expected. Once Actraiser had finally hit store shelves, Quintet was already hard at work on their next project. It would not be a follow-up to their first game, however, but instead a brand new title called Soul Blazer. This title contained a similar theme to their freshman release, where God, or the Master in English, sent his servant to save the souls of humanity and restore the world's population. Once Soul Blazer finalized development in 1992, Enix of America approached Hashimoto and Miyazaki about creating a follow-up to Actraiser. Rather than leaving all of the design concepts up to Quintet, they wanted the game made to certain specifications, which they thought would make it more accepted in Western markets. Hashimoto would once again oversee the project as the lead director and main programmer. Miyazaki would write and direct the scenario alongside Ayano Koshiro, who would also act as the title's main art director and designer, and Yuzo Koshiro returned to compose the game's orchestral-inspired soundtrack. This sequel, appropriately titled Actraiser 2, spent much of its development time in parallel with another popular title, Illusion of Gaia or Illusion of Time depending on the region, which stretched Quintet's employees thin and created many tough and stressful deadlines between the two projects. Much like Actraiser's arcade version and its special slash professional modes, this new game would ditch the simulation sections and become a pure platformer, containing only more action-heavy side-scrolling stages. As had become common with many games designed with a western focus, this new title was incredibly challenging with many difficult enemies and obstacles. It would require a lot of patience and a firm understanding of its mechanics if players wanted any chance of seeing it to its conclusion. The story began with a winged and much more muscular god, or the master in English, defeating Satan, or Tanzra, in an epic battle much like the events at the very end of the first game. Satan's chosen 13 followers pulled him back to the underworld and eventually revived him. He and his minions then later set out to take revenge on both God and the people of the world. Quintet wanted this sequel to be focused around the theme of flight. Just like its predecessor, God would still take control of a statue and be able to defeat enemies with his sword, but he now had wings which gave him much more mobility. The animated statue could now double jump, glide down at different speeds, and execute a dive bomb attack with its sword. While combat was still a big focus, this added mobility put an even bigger spotlight on the platforming aspect of the stages. The statue avatar also now had a shield which it could defend with while standing still that could be angled either up or down to protect against enemy attacks. Magic spells would return from the first title as well, but now functioned a bit differently. The game's seven different spells required the player to hold the attack button and charge up the magic spell. Rather than choosing which spell could be used beforehand, the magic attack that was cast would depend on the state of the statue avatar. These included spells like shooting an arc of fireballs while looking up, creating an AoE earth attack while crouching, and shooting out four sparks around the player while jumping in the air. 
God's statue avatar would need to progress through seven different stages split into two acts each, many of which could be tackled in whichever order the player chose, before facing off once more against Satan in Deathheim. The names of the different regions and locations differed from the first entry, making it unclear whether or not Actraiser 2 canonically took place in the same universe as its predecessor. The game launched first in Japan on the Super Famicom in October of 1993 under the title Akutoreza 2 Jinmako e no Seisen, translating roughly to Actraiser 2 Crusade to Silence. It then made its way to North America the following month on the Super NES without its subtitle in November of 1993, and would finally hit European store shelves in late 1994. Actraiser 2 received mostly positive reviews. Critics were impressed by its gorgeous graphics, well-composed soundtrack, and incredibly challenging gameplay, though many noted that the new gliding controls took some time to get used to. Many were also surprised and a bit upset at the omission of the simulation segments from the first game. Unfortunately, Actraiser 2 ended up performing much worse sales-wise than its initial entry, especially in Japan. In 1996, three years after Actraiser 2 had first launched, Quintet announced it had been working on a remake for the Sega Saturn that combined the first two Actraiser games with a working title of Act Remix. But about halfway through its development, the team was worried that it wouldn't resonate well with consumers in the mid-90s, and the title pivoted in the opposite direction that the series' sequel had gone, focusing only on the simulation sections from the original game. Some Japanese publications even referred to the game as Akutoreza Gaiden, but it eventually split off into an entirely brand new IP titled Solo Crisis. Solo Crisis featured slower-paced gameplay that required the player to move their characters over an expanse of land defeating enemies while building structures and using miracles to manipulate the environment. While its movement, combat, and art style were closer to that of games like Final Fantasy Tactics and Fire Emblem, Many of the core elements from Actraiser's simulation segments still remained, and some fans still consider it to be a spiritual successor to the series. Solo Crisis released in 1998 for the Sega Saturn in Japan, but never made its way outside of the country, and still remains exclusive even today. Quintet continued making games for nearly a decade following Solo Crisis, though many of these projects were simply development support on licensed titles. Sadly, they would close their doors and officially cease all development work in 2008. Masaya Hashimoto would briefly continue working in the video game industry with Ancient, Yuzo and Ayano Koshiro's development company, before eventually leaving for his own reasons and disappearing from the public eye. Tomoyoshi Miyazaki's post-Quintet events are much less clear. He would join another game development company after Quintet called Giga Factory, and apparently later ran into some serious legal issues leading to his arrest. Just like Hashimoto, he vanished from the public eye a few years after Quintet's closure and has remained hidden away, unable to be contacted. With Quintet ceasing operation and both of its founders disappearing, many of Actraiser's fans were unsure and concerned about what would become of the series and its chances of getting any sort of remaster or revival. Those worries would be put to rest, however, as the series would later miraculously rise from the ashes. By 2021, it had been almost a decade and a half since Actraiser had last seen a port of any kind. The series' 30th anniversary had already come and gone in 2020 without any major celebratory news or releases. A game called Soul Seraph was released in 2019 by Sega, which paid heavy homage to Actraiser's blend of action and simulation-based gameplay, with Yuzo Koshiro even being contracted to compose its main theme. But the title fell flat with most critics, and sadly was not the Actraiser revival many fans had been waiting for. 
This all changed though on September 23rd during a Nintendo Direct. Nintendo's live online presentations, where a brand new version of the first Actraiser was announced and subsequently released that very same day. The game was titled Actraiser Renaissance, and it would be much more than just a simple port or remaster of Quintet's 1990 debut release. The project was a joint collaboration between Square Enix, Japanese developer Sonic Powered, and Yuzo Koshiro's Ancient. Square Enix had greenlit the game in preparation for the series' 30th anniversary, although the title unfortunately missed its celebratory debut by just a year. When development began on Actraiser Renaissance, the team spent a lot of time dissecting the original Actraiser to better understand its appeal and why it was such a special experience. While they thought the original release was a great game and stood on its own merits, they were worried that some of its gameplay might not resonate as well with a modern audience and wanted to make some changes, allowing for it to be a bit more accessible to newcomers while adding something new for fans of the original. Rather than being a simple HD remaster of Quintet's debut title, Actraiser Renaissance would change and evolve to become much closer to a full-on remake. With this decision to add and alter elements from Actraiser's 1990 release, its development team was incredibly careful with each and every decision they made to make sure that they retained the essence of the original. When deciding on the remake's graphical style, they debated back and forth between using either classic 2D pixel art or going with a more modern 3D look, before finally settling on 3D models set on a 2D plane. The progression of the game remained mostly unchanged, with God, now named the Lord of Light in English, making his way through all six regions, each containing a simulation segment sandwiched between two action stages, to eventually face off against Satan or Tanzra. The action-focused platforming stages would be altered and lengthened somewhat, with God's statue avatar now gaining access to an array of new combat moves, like downward and upward slashes, a dodge maneuver, and additional magic spells. The overhead view simulation sections saw many of the biggest changes, however. The player would still control the angel who directed humanity's expansion efforts for each region, but now he could charge his bow and arrow shots, collect building supplies and resources, and complete quest objectives that gained the player experience points to level up. A morality system was originally planned to be added that would affect how the player approached the simulation sections, but it was cut before everything was finalized. Another big change was when sealing monster layers on the map, rather than the humans simply sealing the location, God's statue avatar would have to go in and complete a short action platforming segment, destroying the monster spawner within. The weather-based miracles like lightning and rain would not be altered too much in Renaissance, but now had three levels of strength which had larger areas of effect and cost different amounts of SP depending on which level of the miracle was used. The title's story would be expanded on as well, with many new characters being introduced to help lengthen and add more meaningful interactions to the narrative. These characters would not only be added for story purposes though. A brand new Settlement Siege mode was added to the simulation segments and featured tower defense-like gameplay. These siege sections took place multiple times during each chapter while expanding the settlements of each region, and required the player to defend the humans from waves of enemy attacks by directing the newly added characters and using miracles to ward off the oncoming hordes. Upgradable structures like gatehouses, blockhouses, and magehouses could also be built around a region using the resources collected by the angel to help both defeat enemies and slow down their advancing armies. The project's team decided to add this new siege mode because they found much of the time in later parts of a region's simulation section from the original game were spent waiting around with little to do and wanted to try and make things a lot more exciting and interactive. They also thought it was unrealistic to think that the title's main antagonist would just sit idly by while the humans expanded and cultivated his land. Probably the most surprising addition to the title was a brand new post-game region called Akaleon that added more story, a brand new action stage, a new boss, and additional town building and siege mode gameplay segments. The development staff not only desired to create a much larger and more expansive region with Akaleon than any of those found in the original game, but also wanted to write a scenario where all of its newly introduced characters could come together in a final chapter and work as a team. 
The Super NES version of Actraiser's unique blend of gameplay genres was a big part of what made it so memorable, but its impressive soundtrack was also synonymous with why it was so adored and successful. Yuzo Koshiro was asked to return once more and make updated arrangements of all the existing tracks using much more modern and high quality orchestral samples, as well as compose 15 additional brand new pieces of music. Players could even choose between listening to either these newly arranged versions or the classic Super NES soundtrack. With the decision to include this option, Koshiro would need to recreate all of his new compositions using similar sound font samples found in the original 1990 game. Actraiser Renaissance was released digitally worldwide on September 23rd, 2021 for the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Steam, and iOS and Android mobile devices. While many were excited about its announcement, the game received mixed reviews from critics. Many applauded the addition of its new region, expanded stages, and new gameplay types, as well as its amazing soundtrack. But some were not so positive about the title's pacing and the randomness of its new Settlement Siege mode. Either way, most fans were just happy to see the series back, even if the final product wasn't perfect. Actraiser Renaissance is the most recent game in the series up to this point in 2022, and its producer has stated he'd like to give Actraiser 2 the same treatment as Renaissance, though at this time there are currently no plans to do so. Back in 1989, Quintet's willingness to scrap their more straightforward RPG project and pivot to try and make something more unique and riskier that combined two unlikely genres was what made them such a special developer and helped gain them the admiration of an incredibly passionate fanbase. Actraiser's gameplay wasn't the pinnacle of platforming, nor did it reinvent the simulation genre, but its combination of the two made for quite a different and more memorable experience than many other video games on the market could offer at the time. Both Quintet and Actraiser were incredibly important to the evolution of the gaming industry and showed that sometimes taking a risk can lead to some pretty remarkable results. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this was originally supposed to be about Quintet from start to finish, uh, before I decided kind of early on to condense it to being just Actraiser. I may go back at some point though and cover the other games and then kind of Frankenstein everything together into being a full history of Quintet video. Uh, but for now, it's just Actraiser. I don't have a lot of nostalgia for the series since I never owned the games as a kid, uh, but I did enjoy playing through them, uh, and I really liked Renaissance. I thought Renaissance was a great game, and uh, I think people were a little too harsh with it. Uh, so I do recommend checking it out if you're a fan of the original or a newcomer. I think it caters really well to both, and is worth a playthrough. So putting the script together for this video is probably the toughest one I've had to do so far. Uh, I had to rewrite things two to three times. It was just, I, I had a tough time kind of getting the flow correctly. Uh, and it was probably another big reason why I decided to make it just the history of Actraiser instead of the history of Quintet. Uh, but I feel like it came out pretty well. Not not my favorite, but it still was a, was a fun one to put together from uh, start to finish. I'd also like to give a shout out to John Stepaniak. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm butchering that name. Uh, but his Untold History of Japanese Game Developers book series, there's three books out there, uh, was really helpful for writing this. And uh, I highly recommend checking it out. They're, they're great reads and have a lot more information uh, than what I covered, obviously. So thank you once more for watching the video all the way to the end. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and look forward to more soon. Thank you so much. Bye.